Good morning, friends. It is wonderful to be with you, and it's easy to be encouraged seeing you, and there is so much to be encouraged by in the church today, beautiful Christ-likeness, resilient faith, healthy, growing churches, but the church today is sick. We know this. Deviance from the scriptural gospel is heartbreakingly pervasive. From watered down theologies to straight up heresy. And then there is the behavior of so many who bear the name of Christ. And it's, it's not just the constant drip of Christians behaving badly. Underneath that is a, a culture of a proud, self-concerned, loveless, human-centeredness. And I think John's words in John 12, verse 43, sum it up and diagnose us. He said, they loved the glory of men more than the glory of God. Those words cut like a scalpel to expose us and our motivations. We love the glory of men more than the glory of God. Earlier in John's gospel, Jesus had said that this was the seed of the Pharisees' problem, which was the leaven of hypocrisy. He said to them in John 5 verse 44, how can you believe when you seek glory from men, from others? How can you believe when you seek glory from others and do not seek the glory that comes from God? That was the wellspring of the Pharisees' every mistake. They were addicted to the praise and glory of others. Where Jesus said plainly of himself, I do not seek glory from people. For the Pharisees, they preferred the acclamation of the people. They could not believe because they received glory from one another and did not seek the glory that comes from the only God. So their lust for the approval of others made them forget to seek the approval of God. In fact, it blinded them to God with their eyes down on others, hungry for popularity and praise, they wouldn't dare confess Christ or go against the crowd. Instead, said Jesus, they do all their deeds to be seen by others. They make their phylacteries broad, their fringes long, they love the place of honor at feasts, the best seats in the synagogues, greetings in the marketplaces, being called rabbi by others. And is that not what we see everywhere today? And here's the question I want to ask. How could the Pharisees choose the approval of mere creatures over the approval of the Lord of glory. How could they do it? Because when it's put so starkly, the choice is irrational, it's idiotic. Yet it's a choice we all make every day. And the reasoning is not hard to make out. They preferred the glory of men 
Because, quite simply, God was not sufficiently glorious in their eyes. And that, too, I suggest, is our problem today. In 1677, Henry Skugel published The Life of God in the Soul of Man. It was a work that some 50 years later convinced George Whitfield of his need to be born again. And in it, Skugel argued that true religion is more than a matter of orthodox opinion. It is more than a matter of moral behavior. It is more than a matter of emotional ecstasy. True religion, said Skugel, is a delightful and affectionate sense of the divine perfections, which makes the soul resign and sacrifice itself wholly unto him, desiring above all things to please him. And delighting in nothing so much as fellowship and communion with him and being ready to do or suffer anything for his sake or at his pleasure. That, I think, is precisely what is so lacking today. This delightful and affectionate sense of the divine perfections. For when we are blind to the gloriousness of God, of course we'll be more impressed with our own glory. Of course we will seek more from others. And that spiritual short-sightedness will then imprison us in worldliness and the hamster wheel of people-pleasing because we're constantly trying to get the acclaim, the approval of others. And so no wonder so many find no true pleasure in prayer or in reading God's word. They do not perceive a higher pleasure can be found in God himself. And this is precisely what the Puritans appreciated, what they can teach us. And one of the most essential ways they can help us today. Because unlike modern Christian human-centeredness, the Puritans saw... Unlike how we see sin as a small problem, Christ is a small saviour, God is merely one satellite orbiting us. The Puritans saw that integrity to the gospel requires a God-centeredness. For the gospel is, after all, the gospel of the glory of the blessed God, 1 Timothy 1.11. And that aroma of worshipful, trembling wonder at God just oozes, radiates from every page of the Puritans from their writings. You can't miss it. If you've opened a Puritan, you know this. I'm not telling you anything you don't know. It's something that immediately struck me the very first page I opened of my first Puritan, John Owen. And it had the exotic foreign smell of a wholly different mentality. Deep in the Puritan DNA is the sense that God is the portion, the glory, the reward, the treasure of the believer. 
the, the Puritans saw, as, as Paul put it in Romans chapter 4, Abraham grew in faith as he gave glory to God. They saw in Scripture the saints cry, You, Lord, are my glory, my portion, the lifter of my head. They saw how Paul would write to the Galatians, Am I seeking the approval of man or of God? Am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. This is the tonic the Puritans offer us. And to be clear, this is not just a small recalibration of focus that they give us. For your view of God will be the mold that will shape your understanding of the gospel. If you fail to see the blazing glory of God in the beauty of his holiness, then you will fail to see how repulsive and monstrous sin against him is. And when God is small, sin is small. And when sin is small, well, it doesn't take much to sort it out, does it? If sin is a small problem, salvation need only mean a cooperative effort in which God chips in to help you out a bit. Only when God is high and magnificent, where sin is deep and vile, only then can you see that salvation is a true rescue of the helpless. Only then can you abandon the prison of your self-reliance and rely entirely on the all-sufficiency of Christ. Only when you see that you are a great sinner will you appreciate Christ as a great saviour. And that is the door the Puritans open for us. Now, to take us through the door, I want you to hear an authentic Puritan voice, as unmediated as possible. And so, rather than giving you my own Puritan puree, I am going to introduce one. I might mention a couple of others, but I'm basically going to introduce one representative discourse that captures Puritan theology proper. And I was spoilt for choice. But the Puritan I've chosen is Stephen Charnock because of his magisterial discourse on the existence and attributes of God. And at the summit of that work is his discourse upon the holiness of God. Let's dive into it. Charnock's discourse on the holiness of God is an opening up of Exodus 15, verse 11. Exodus 15, verse 11, it's from Moses' song of victory at the Red Sea. Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee? Glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders. And Charnock chose that text because he said this verse is one of the loftiest descriptions of the majesty and excellency of God in the whole scripture. Now, why should such a significant text be found in Exodus 15? Because 
the redemption of the people through water that Moses sung about was not only a historical triumph, it was also a type or picture of the great redemption to come. So Charnock observes, he says, many words in this song are put in the future tense, noting a time to come. Moses says in verse 1, I will sing, implying, says Charnock, it was composed and calculated for the celebrating some greater action of God's which was to be wrought in the world. In other words, Moses' song of triumph in Exodus 15, it casts a backward look at what God had done for them in their deliverance from Egypt, and it casts a look forward to what God would do for the church in the future. And what Charnock wants to focus on here is what it means that God is glorious in holiness. And this means entering the theological holy of holies. For the holiness of God, he says, is the blessedness and nobleness of his nature. It renders him glorious in himself and glorious to his creatures that understand anything of this lovely perfection. Now, did that surprise you? Just hear how different Charnock sounds when he's describing God's holiness. Because many Christians today, I think, find the idea of holiness faintly off-putting. Being set apart smells priggish and prickly, standoffish. As if holiness means morose sourness. And so you hear people say, oh, yes, God is loving, but he is also holy, as if holiness is an unloving thing, the cold side of God that won't attract us so much as the loving side of God. That is not at all how Charnock speaks. Try this. Though we conceive God infinite in majesty, Infinite in essence, eternal in duration, mighty in power, wise and immutable in his counsels, merciful in his proceedings with men, and whatsoever other perfections may dignify so sovereign a being. Yet, if we conceive him destitute of this excellent perfection of holiness... If we imagine him possessed with the least contagion of evil, we make him an infinite monster and sully all those perfections we ascribed to him before. We rather own him a devil than a god without holiness. So far from an unpleasant negative quality in God, the holiness of God is precisely what makes him so glorious and beautiful. It is his glory and beauty. It is the essential glory of his nature, he says. Charnock puts it like this. He says, holiness is the luster of the divine nature. So much so that if we acknowledge God's eternity, immutability, omnipresence, wisdom, power, and yet if we deny his holiness, we make him out to be an unbeautiful monster, a deformed power. 
In other words, the true greatness and magnificence of God is not found ultimately in his sovereign power, but in the holy character that wields that power. Without holiness, we would only dread God. Power alone could be devilish, not glorious. But Charnock says, holiness is the glory of all his other perfections. So, this renders him comfortable to a believing soul. Might, he said, might we not fear his power to crush us? Might we not fear his mercy to overlook us, his wisdom to design against us if this holiness did not influence them? What an oppression is power without righteousness in the hand of a creature. It is destructive instead of protecting. The devil is a mighty spirit, but not fit to be trusted because he is an impure spirit. Therefore, Jonak says, we should think of God's perfections like this. Power is God's hand and arm. Omniscience, his eye. Mercy, his bowels, his innermost affection. Eternity, his duration. His holiness is his beauty. To describe God as glorious in holiness is to picture him as radiant in pure and perfect loveliness. It is to see him as the light of heaven who will drive away all darkness. Which means, your reaction to God's holiness depends on whether you love light or whether you fear the exposure of the light and so prefer the darkness. Holiness, said Charnock, renders God lovely to all his innocent creatures, though formidable to the guilty ones. Sinners dread holiness, not because holiness in itself is a bad thing, but because the pure light of heaven is overwhelming, exposing, and so fearful to them. They prefer their darkness and their chains to the light of heaven. It's small wonder then that our culture is building ever higher walls to defend itself from the unsettling beauty of God, or even from the very idea of there being an absolute beauty. Traditional conceptions of beauty are being dismissed as discriminatory, non-egalitarian. All things are said to be equally beautiful. The existence of any absolute beauty is denied as the arts and the media simultaneously fear and revel in the ugly, the dark, the perverse. Now, Given that God's holiness is pure light, a light that by its very nature drives out darkness, Charnock observes from Exodus 15, holiness is seen most clearly in judgment, light driving out darkness. 
This attribute, he says, is never so much applauded as when his sword has been drawn and he's manifested the greatest fierceness against his enemies. The magnificent, triumphant expression of it in the text follows upon God's miraculous defeat and ruin of the Egyptian army. The sea covered them. They sank as lead in the mighty waters. Then it follows, who is like unto thee, O Lord, glorious in holiness? So the gloriousness of God's holiness is displayed in his judgment of the Egyptians. But as Jonak has made clear, this whole episode in Exodus the judgment of Egypt, the redemption of Israel, is a type, a foreshadowing of God's definitive act of redemption through judgment in Christ. And therefore, if the gloriousness of God's holiness is displayed most clearly in judgment, it is in the cross of Christ that we most clearly see the true gloriousness of holiness. This holiness of God, he explains, appears in the manner of our restoration, that is, by the death of Christ. Not all the vials of judgment that have or shall be poured out upon the wicked world, nor the flaming furnace of a sinner's conscience, nor the irreversible sentence pronounced against the rebellious devils, nor the groans of the damned creatures. None give such a demonstration of God's hatred of sin as the wrath of God let loose upon the sun. Never did divine holiness appear more beautiful and more lovely than at the time our Savior's countenance was most marred in the midst of his dying groans. And to support this, Charnut, Charnut goes to what is often treated as a classic text on God's holiness. Isaiah's vision of the Lord in the temple. There in Isaiah 6, Isaiah sees the Lord on his throne, high and lifted up, and the seraphim are above him, and they cry one to another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And Charnock says, remember, the Apostle John explains in John 12, 41, Isaiah said these things because he saw Jesus' glory and spoke of him. It was, Charnock said, the glory of Christ Isaiah saw in this vision. Christ, therefore, he says, is God blessed forever, of whom it was said, holy, 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 Lord God of hosts. It is when the suffering servant is pierced for our transgressions, when he is high and lifted up, exalted on the cross, that's when we see what holy, holy, holy means. Jesus said, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know I am. For the hour of his glorification when his true nature would blaze most brilliantly was the hour when he was lifted up, exalted on the cross to die. So Charnock argues that all our natural knowledge of God is dim. The clear knowledge of God is attained only through Christ. 
Nobody, he says, can have any knowledge of God from the book of the creatures and the dictates of nature, but what is terrible without a mediator. All notions of God out of Christ are below him, many times unworthy of him, foul and undecent in themselves. So talk of God's glory and holiness without Christ will be skewed and unfaithful. In fact, Charnock and the Puritan tradition he represents is so tenaciously Christ-centered that while he has the highest theology, he refuses to have a Christless big God theology. And that's very evident in the discourse before the one on the holiness of God, his discourse on the power of God. The discourse on the power of God, that's the place where you could think big God could simply mean powerful God. But that is not what Charnock sees. For if powerful God were all that we meant, we would merely dread and not love the one who is almighty. And so in that discourse on the power of God, Charnock considers the tremendous, sovereign, transcendent might of the Creator and then says, though those things in creation argue a stupid stupendous power of the Creator in His works of creation and providence, yet they are nothing to what may be declared of His power. These are but little crumbs and fragments of that infinite power which is in His nature. So if then even the cosmos does not wholly reveal the full might of God, where do we see the immeasurable greatness of his might? Where? Ephesians 1. In Christ, when God raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. So you see, what Charnock sees is that it is all too easy to point people to God's grandeur as creator, which is absolutely right to do, but then fail to point to the gospel and God's grandeur as a compassionate savior as well. And when we fail to go there, God may appear great, but he will not appear good. For we fail to take people into the inner sanctum of God's greatness, the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Outside of Christ, in a great God, Outside of Christ, we see thick clouds and darkness. But Jesus is the rainbow set in the cloud. He is the one in which the radiant glory of God is seen and all the colors of the beautiful perfections of God are blazoned forth. And so said Charnock, nothing of God looks terrible in Christ to a believer. The sun is risen, shadows have vanished, God walks upon the battlements of love. Justice has left its sting in a Savior's side. The law is disarmed, weapons out of his hand, his bosom open, his bowels yearn, his heart pants sweetness, and love is in all his carriage. And this is life eternal, to know 
God believingly in the glories of his mercy and justice in Jesus Christ. Only in the face of Christ can we begin to understand the true beauty of God's holiness and the goodness of divine glory. There we see his is not a grasping, preening glory, but the radiance of the Father of glory, the one so superabounding in life that he generates glory. In Christ, we see a glory infinitely more lovely than the needy, acquisitive glory of idols, sinners. Without need or lack, his is the glory of an overflowing fountain of holy love and life. In polar contrast to our sinful understandings of glory, where we avoid the needy, where we seek our own good. In Christ crucified, we see a divine glory that confers good, that shines light into darkness, that gives life and righteousness to unworthy and helpless sinners. Never would we have dreamed that God would be so beautifully set apart from us. And only then will we begin to love the glory of God more than the glory of men. Hope for liberation from ourselves and from our spiritual emptiness lies in the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, whose dazzling allure is found in the face of Jesus Christ. Only there do we see the treasure our hearts were made to enjoy. When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know I am. And with that, Charnock has got to a place where he's ready to define the nature of God's holiness. And Charnock says there are two ways we can define holiness. The first is a negative definition. He says, the holiness of God negatively is a perfect freedom from all evil. As we call gold pure, that is not embased by any dross, and that garment clean, which is free from any spot, so the nature of God is estranged from all shadow of evil, all imaginable contagion. But Charnock sees we must go further. For if we only define holiness negatively, it is easy to misconstrue holiness as a negative quality. And that is a problem far too many have. They do not see or have not been shown the beauty of God's holiness. Holiness to them sounds like nothing more than divine scowling. And if that's what holiness is, then at best they will merely tremble before God's holiness. At worst, far from loving him, they will shudder at the thought that there is a holy God in heaven. And they will hate him in their hearts. 
So Charnock sees God's holiness must not only be defined in opposition to evil, because evil started to exist long after he was holy. Evil has a start point. His holiness is eternal. And therefore, Charnock says, we must also define holiness positively as the rectitude or integrity of the divine nature. The integrity of the divine nature. So what Charnock sees is that God's holiness is not just his separateness from us sinners in his righteousness, because he was holy before there were sinners. God's holiness is not just his separateness from us creatures as creator, for he was holy before there was a creation. God's holiness is the perfection of who he is eternally. It is the lucidity and spotlessness of the triune God who is eternally love. Jonathan Edwards would later say the same. He would say, both the holiness and happiness of the Godhead consists in this love between the persons of the Godhead. As we've already proved, he said, all creature holiness consists essentially in love to God and love to other creatures. So does the holiness of God consist in this love, especially in the perfect and intimate union and love there is between the Father and the Son. This is why holiness looks so beautiful, so loving in the law. The first and greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul. And the second, love your neighbor as yourself. If that's what it looks like to be uprightly in the image of God, that says something beautifully profound about the holiness of God. Love the Lord your God, love your neighbor as yourself. That is being like this God. To take a classic text, Leviticus 19. You shall be holy for I, the Lord your God, am holy. What does holiness look like in Leviticus 19? Well, it means, first of all, not turning to idols, but coming to the Lord with peace or fellowship offerings. That's the first few verses of Leviticus 19. Peace or fellowship with the Lord, for he is the Lord of peace. And the next few verses, verses 10 to 16, it looks like compassion for your neighbor, being good and kind to others. In other words, holiness looks like Leviticus 19, 18, love your neighbor as yourself. Why? I am the Lord. Holiness is loving. For God is love. And because that is the beautiful nature of God's holiness set apart from us, not in priggishness or standoffishness, but by the fact that there is no darkness or dirtiness in him. No viciousness. None. And because that is the case the wonder of God's holiness is a most attractive thing to saints. Dreadful to those who fear exposure, but beautiful, sweet, pleasant to his children. God's holiness, says Charnock, renders him fit to be confided in 
for the comfort of our souls in a broken condition. The reviving of hearts of the spiritually afflicted is part of the holiness of his nature. He looks at Isaiah 57, thus says the high and lofty one that inhabits eternity, whose name is Holy, I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble. And Charnock says this, God acknowledges himself the lofty one. They might therefore fear he would not revive them. But he is also the Holy One, and therefore he will refresh them. He is not more lofty than he is holy. His greatness, his greatness does not mean remoteness. His holiness refreshes, revives the humble. It awakens our delight in God. And it is the very ground of our confidence in God in prayer. Charnock notices in John 17, when Jesus prays for his people, it is the holiness of God that is the ground of his prayer. In John 17, 11, the Savior prays, Holy Father, keep them in your name. Not merciful Father, powerful Father, wise Father, Holy Father, keep them. This is why we need the Puritans, great and glorious, marvelous and magnificent view of God. Without it, we will prefer the glory of men. And will that, along with that preference for the glory of men, will come timid, joyless, people-pleasing, drift to fit in, drift from the good news of rescuing mercy from heaven for wretched, ruined sinners on earth. It is our failure to appreciate the glory and holiness of God that is at the root of of our sickness today, just as it was for the Pharisees in Jesus' day. Do you think of the Pharisee in the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector in Luke 18? That Pharisee, he'd not perceived this glory of God. The Pharisee showed no awareness of his need for mercy, or even the fact that God might have such a thing as mercy. Which is why he sought to stand before God based upon his merits, not God's mercy. So the Pharisee's God was, at best, a conditionally loving God. And small wonder then that the Pharisees' idea of godliness was unyielding and harsh. It reflected his idea of God. And so it must be for all who fail to appreciate the gloriousness of God. They will not love God or find satisfaction in him. They'll become what they do Become like what they do worship in the image of a petty deity. See, the Pharisee's problem was with his view of God. And that same failure to appreciate the heavenly beauty and goodness and gloriousness of God is seen in every church. 
revealing itself in lives that lack a heartfelt delight in God. And you know, this was precisely the condition that Augustine diagnosed in the monk Pelagius who taught a salvation by works. So Pelagius argued, our problem is we've done bad things and we need to start doing good things to get into heaven. Now, as Augustine saw it, everyone would go for his Pelagius understanding of salvation. As Augustine saw it, Pelagius' problem with salvation actually stemmed from a deeper problem, a defective view of God. Pelagius had failed to see the gloriously loving, compassionate, merciful character of God. Failed to see God himself is the treasure, the glory, the pleasure of believers. Pelagius didn't see that and therefore Pelagius sought not to enjoy God, but to use him as the gatekeeper who sells us entrance into heaven, the reward he really wanted for the price of being good. He didn't want to enjoy God, he just wanted to use him to get the heaven. The problem was with the view of God, and so it is today. Think of it this way, how is it that God blesses his people? In Numbers 6, the Lord made it clear to Moses, it is by the glorious shining of his face upon them. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to Aaron and his sons saying, thus you shall bless the people of Israel. You shall say to them, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So shall they put my name upon the people of Israel and I will bless them. Now, our spiritual hollowness and shallowness today, brothers and sisters, is unable to heal itself. It cannot be cured by a moral campaign or the techniques of self-improvement. Its antidote can only be found in turning outside ourselves, turning to the Lord like Moses, to enjoy communion with God, behold the glory of the Lord, and so be transformed into his radiant image. It is those who look to him who are radiant, says Psalm 34, who find their hollowness filled, their faces begin to shine with holiness. Henry Skugel explained why. He said, true religion is a resemblance of the divine perfections, the image of the Almighty shining in the soul of man. Nay, it is a real participation of his nature. It is a beam of his eternal light. How rarely this is understood. The Puritan Walter Marshall wrote a whole book on this idea titled The Gospel Mystery of Sanctification. And Marshall said, many think the Christian life must be harsh and unpleasant because they do not know the mystery of godliness. He said, this mystery is so great that notwithstanding all the light of the gospel, we commonly think we must get ourselves into a holy state by producing it anew in ourselves. As a result, he said, many that are devout take a great deal of pains to mortify their corrupt nature, beget a holy frame of heart in themselves by only striving earnestly to master their sinful lusts. But, he says... 
This is like trying to squeeze oil out of a flint. Spiritual health is not naturally to be found within us. Christ is the secret or mystery of godliness. 1 Timothy 3.16 Just as we are justified by a righteousness found in Christ, so we are sanctified by a holiness found in him. We must receive spiritual health from its only source, God in Christ. And it's only when we have and enjoy him, fill our eyes with the one lifted up who shows us the glory of God in his face, only then will we have the resources to be like him. This is what the Pharisees just didn't get. This is what so few seem to understand today. The Pharisees kept the most careful eye on their behavior and their performance, but they failed to keep an eye on the glory of God. It meant that they put their trust in themselves. But it is only by beholding the glory of the Lord that we can be transformed from one degree of glory to another. Only then will the image of the Almighty shine in our souls. Only then, seeing his face, will we actually know what sin really is and have the inclination to then fight it. We will be like him only when we see him as he is. As Charnock put it, when God and his glory are made our end, we shall find his likeness pass in upon us. The beauty of God will by degrees enter upon our souls. Brothers and sisters, The issue of issues for us today is this. Which glory do you love most? The glory of men or the glory of God? Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The glory of God in the face of Christ has always been the lodestar, the guiding light of reformation and refreshment in the church. When, like the Puritans, Christians have appreciated God as all perfect, all sufficient, all beautiful, all satisfying, That's when they've been awakened and made fruitful. For them, seeing him, the world is not enough. It's glory and acclaim pale beside the allure of Jesus Christ. And so, look to him. the face of Christ where we see the glory of God's holiness. Look to him and may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face upon you, make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lift his face upon you and give you peace. Amen.